organized. Oh, yeah. It's going to be fun. Uh, this is your paper, I guess? Or yeah, something? absolutely. How long have you been organizing this? Gosh, I don't know. Four years. When did I do this? start doing this for Richard? About four. But I've been doing events forever. So, this is Jack. This is Jack. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are some of the most challenging things for you as an organizer? Quality content. Um, and being able to uh, make sure that we're on ground. Can we do okay? Yeah, absolutely. All right, it is showtime. And the fabulous words of Matthew McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. It's time to start. Oh, I gotta get rid of the Pandora. One second. All right. How many of you are SL Circle virgins? <laughs> okay. This means that this is not going to be the last time we could come, which is a very good thing, because uh, we've got some fantastic events we have here. How many of you, by a raise of hands, have presented for SL Circle? Okay. Which is the next logical uh, question. We have these lunches that we have at the Holodeck, which is our adopted home, that's right across the street here. It's on 2nd South and 175 West. Um, we've got a couple of spots that are still available for the month of May. You can go to events at slcircle.info if at any point you want to be able to submit um, a, a, a request to speak. All right, now this is why I have notes. And why I should have a clicker. All right. Um, on Thursday, if any of you are going to be downtown, we've got a very special treat. We have Patrick Crowley. Do you guys know who he is? Have you watch the uh, Shark Tank? He um, has the cricket bars where you can eat crustaceans, little bit insects. <laughs> and they're actually surprisingly good unless you have a crustacean allergy like I do, then you have to go to the emergency room and get a shot. But not that big deal. That's another story altogether. Uh, Patrick, um, who's had three different rounds with um, uh, Mr. Mark Cuban, is going to be presenting with his partner, Margaret um, Lamy, um, who's one of the organizers for TEDx. So if any of you want to ever be a public speaker and know what it takes to be a public speaker, come on down. It's going to cost you everything of the elevator ride down into the garden room. So join us for lunch. We've got a, a number of other things coming up, but we've got a very, 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 very big agenda today. And with that, I'm going to go to the tradition that we've had from the very beginning with uh, Mr. Richard Swarton, the Study of the Entrepreneurial Circle, where we give three of you a chance to come up here and pitch yourself. So, Isabel Marin, come on up. Matt, won't think you be bad at you. Adam Clau, Clave, Clava. Clava. You don't want to do it? All right, Adam's out. We need another one. <laughs> <laughs> I can never give you his name right after those years. Mark, I'll enjoy this. Mark Ferry, Mark. You, you're up. Okay, next. Oh, you got it. We'll do that. Bob Davis. Bob Davis. Perfect. Better late than never. 
So Isabel, Mark, and Bob Davis come on up. So one of the biggest parts of being in business is being able to be comfortable in your elevator. When you're going down an elevator, you've got to be able to let people know what you do in a very short period of time without being patient. So that's where we come up with who I am, what I do, and what I need. So I'll just read this since I'll wrap along if I go. My name is Joel McKay Smith. I am a champion for Main Street and World Economic Development. I need companies willing to take a chance on small town employees. So that's my elevator pitch. Who I am, what I do, what I need, feel no pressure, you're on. <laughs> my name is Mark Perry. I am um, a owner of a business for 20 years in the area of marketing, which helps websites get the first page of Google or SEO search engine. And what I do that's unique is I put them on the first page of Google in a performance model, no rank, no pay, a kick your tires approach, kick me to the curb if you don't like it, that's what I do. What I'm looking for is relations and anybody who's passionate with the website, but what I do need is anyone who knows a marketing firm, I do private label for other digital marketing companies, especially SEO companies. So if you know anyone, that would be my dream result. Thank you. Fantastic. Isabel, this is your chance to be on the mic. Hi. <laughs> My name is Mariana Isabel Rodrigo Julio but you guys can call me as well. Um, what, I do and why, what I do and why I'm here is I'm a youth ambassador for Future Design. There's Nicolina over there. Hi, Nicolina. <laughs> and basically, it's a program for at risk youth that we're starting up. And so what I need is for you guys to pull up your phones, go on Facebook, look up Future Design, all one word, and go like us and help us get started. And you're going to learn more about this fantastic class later today. And, well, you were the last one in, but you're the, the last one on, too. So go for it, buddy. Hey, my name's Bob Davis. I am a data scientist. And artificial intelligence, you know, has been growing tremendous leaps and bounds in the last 10 years. And I want to start a company making use of artificial intelligence to help people uh, make their lives easier and better. And so one example of that is event planning or scheduling. So I want to build an AI to make it easier so you can just say, hey, I want to plan this event. And then we'll go and contact all the people and work and do all the logistics for you and handle that simple communication. And so I'm looking for um, a marketing and salesperson that wants to co-found this with me as well as a creative design person that wants to help co-found. So I hit me up if you're interested. Cool. Very cool. Um, I'd like to, before I have the other board members come on up, I'd like to thank um, Kirsten. And I can't say it, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm Kirsten Sahagin. Um, who's been helping us out for a while, as well as Nigel Slady. And um, with that, I'd like to move on to the next thing we're going to present, which is Future in Design. Come on up. Don't feel any pressure. It's not like all these people are waiting you to come up here, Nicole, and that's why you Can you guys see that over here? Do I need to put down some uh, windows? By the way, this uh, future in design is the absolute epitome of the um, agile lean model. It's pretty cool. I'm not going to steal their thunder, but uh, it's pretty amazing what they put together. Thank you for up my clicking back. I am going to be your clicker. You're going to be my clicker? I'm going to be your clicker. Fantastic. There All we right, go. Perfect. All right. You can look out right here. Ah, I can show you how to set that right there. Yeah. Hi, everyone. 
So uh, I will finish Isabella. She was like, I should have waited and made them get out their phones. So get out your phones. I'll wait. I'm patient. Find future in design. Future in design. And go like us on Facebook. I'm not one of those people who don't like to hear myself talk. <laughs> um, my name is Nicolina Womack. I'm the executive director and co-founder. Go ahead, Joel. Go ahead. All right, so who we are, we are Future in Design. We are a workforce development program for at-risk young adults. Um, we prepare young adults ages 16 to 20 with the technical skills and creative skills needed for tomorrow's job market. Um, and with that, we also make sure that they are prepared um, with the life skills needed to also cross that chasm um, as they're transitioning into adulthood and into their professional lives. And we accomplish this through in-house job training, internships, and industry externships. And we also so do that with developing um, the entire individual through a social enterprise nonprofit model where they actually work and earn a stipend and earn school credit. So that really quickly is who we are. And now I'll kind of go into the little bit more the nitty gritty. You're only going to hear five stats from me. I'm not going to tell you a statistic, right? I think anyone when we talk about social good, they like to paint the picture of how destitute the world is. We all know that there's there's a lot of social issues out there that really need our attention. So you only have to remember five, okay? I'm gonna be really, really easy on you guys. So the first one is, is 84%. 84% is the number that the Bureau, last year, the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that and manufacturer employers are saying that our young adults are not graduating college prepared for tomorrow's work, workforce. And that's with this like basic skills, like public speaking, work ethic, being able to be on time, work attendance, and how that is crossing into reality is now that makes college an even bigger jump to be able to make. So here's your second statistic, 34% of our young adults are not even attempting college by the time they graduate high school. And 51%, that's your third statistic, will enter college, but they're never going to graduate. So this leaves our youth at risk. And when we're talking about children at risk, there's a lot of different definitions that we hear. It kind of, and I like to look at it as a spectrum. Over here you have maybe a youth that has to deal with one big adverse life event that can cause some setbacks in their life. Maybe it's a divorce in the family. Maybe it's um, dealing with some type of a, 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 a death in their, in their family. Maybe it's poverty. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have youth that are compounded with adverse life effects. So I'm just going to ask you guys and have you participate with me in just a quick little activity. By the raise of hands in your lifetime, how many of you know a child that has had to deal with their family being unemployed? And as you have raised your hands, I want you to keep them up. Okay? <laughs> How many of you have had or know a child that's had to deal with divorce? How many of you know a child that's had to deal with poverty? How many of you know a child has had to deal with a mental health issue in their family or themselves? So take a second and look around the room. No one, I think maybe one or two people don't have their hand raised. So when you think about at risk, we all fall along that spectrum. So this not being prepared for tomorrow's workforce with the skills needed or the life skills needed, all that does is put our children at risk 
for any one of these things that you see on the screen. And they happen every day. Because at the point of the mountain, if you live in the state of Utah, you are paying $30,000 per year for an inmate. So over the lifetime of five to 10 years, who's really good at math? So what's 33,000 for a five year sentence? Okay, our youth recidivism rate is 52%. So that means you're not paying 30,000, you're actually paying 60,000 a year for incarceration. What's 60,000 a year times five? What? <laughs> <laughs> a crap ton of money. You could buy all the Tesla Model S's your heart could desire. And you could probably probably give everyone just in the city of Salt Lake their own Tesla. So at some point, you're being affected by this. But what we've developed is called tech in the margins. We take, we understand that the richest access to resources right now, if you think of Silicon Valley, is this bubble. You kind of hear of it, and you kind of think of it as this bubble that's kind of out there. And what it does is it has some amazing resources. For example, a lot of these jobs in STEM, they require less than a four-year degree, and they start at 53000 a year. That is a livable wage. Now, we don't discourage college. We encourage college. We encourage them to be prepared for whatever choices they make. But right now, there's a gap that they fundamentally are not receiving. And so that's what we do. We bring that circle out to the margins. Because 90% of youth, this is the last statistic, in low socioeconomic families only have access to technology via mobile. We rank as millennials dead last being able to solve in technology in the United States. So if you're a child living on the margins of this, what is your ability to be able to get access to those jobs for tomorrow? Not really. So our three-tier program, go ahead, clicker. Our three-tier program is a nine-month program where youth, again, they earn a stipend, they earn school credit, and their first tier is they learn a technical design skill, which we just partnered with Adobe. We are now officially partnered with Adobe, which we're pretty excited about. We're actually the first nonprofit organization in Utah to infiltrate Adobe. That's not the last. And not the last, but the first. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, they're going to learn the Adobe Creative Suite. As they move on to that, they're going to move into our next phase, which is our personal portfolio development. Well, we're going to have our, we're, that's actually our sustainability model. So we will offer design services to startups, to entrepreneurs, to nonprofits, and big courts on a sliding fee scale um, based on volume, where they actually will then the youth will get to work with these industries, work with these clients, learn those life skills needed, learn those design skills, and be able to develop a portfolio. And they're able to give back to the community. And it's a great way for the community to give back and do great while they're doing good. And then the last phase is job shadowing. So that's our externship program. They get to go and job shadow and work and getting a paid apprenticeships with local industry leaders, which is fantastic. So by the time our youth graduate, they have a technical skill, they have a resume, because they have job experience, and they have a portfolio. So if they want to go to college, they're ready. If they want to go in and become an entrepreneur, they're ready. Ruby? Not last one. Okay. What do they do wrong? I don't know. Go next. They're playing here. Oh, they don't want to play it. Yeah. You're going to be the first person in our cohort, though. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what do they do wrong? Just keep going, hit the arrow again. Yeah. And when you're talking about really breaking the constraints of intergenerational poverty, because that's really what we're doing here, it has to be a three-tiered approach. You can't just give someone a great technical skill or give them amazing life skills 
one or the other, if you're not also going to help do the dirty work, which is give them great mental support. So we're going to partner with local community partners that deal with um, access, give access to mental health services. So our youth, if they are dealing with traumas in their lives or their families, we'll make sure they have access to direct services and get the skills they need to be able to deal with those traumas. Because it doesn't matter how wonderful you prepare them, if they have dealt with some serious traumas in their lives that have made them seriously at risk, those are going to manifest as an adult. And that's a new study that's come out of John Hopkins University. And it's called the ACEs study. If you want to look it up, it's the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. So we are going to also make sure that they are empowered with those tools. And again, the life skills training will be embedded all the way through our curriculum. They get financial literacy. They get post-secondary exploration. They get um, workforce readiness. They're actually going to design their own resumes and design their own cover letters. Next. So once they're able to do this, all we're preparing them for is to be able to cross the next hill and chasms of life. Because they're going to come, right? But hopefully our goal is that we make those next chasms smaller because they're prepared and that they have the momentum to go up the next bigger hills of life. That's what we do. See, I think I have a lot more respect for her. She has some level of passion for what she's doing. <laughs> Drew and Ben, I know it's daily. These guys are a lot of fun. Um, we um, share um, a fantastic incubator and accelerator space um, <laughs> called um, Holodeck with the creators of Shrek. Did you guys know that? These guys were um, in the movie business and everything else. So you're going to see up online what their demonstration is. And I'm going to be up here completely quiet. So why don't you tell them what you guys can do? I forgot a clicker for you. I'm sure it's only one. I'll be the clicker. I can do it. By the way, you're going to have something really cool coming to you here in just a little bit. So go ahead. Uh, hi. So I'm uh, Dave DeBry. Uh, everybody calls me Drew because he's David Hart, and that's too many Davids for a two person company. Um, so Limnu is a new take on collaborative online whiteboards. Uh, it's it's designed to save your team time and money by being faster, more approachable, and uh, on more on more devices than uh, any other tool out there. So I'm just gonna I'm not gonna give you the whole pitch. I just want to give you a really brief overview of what's going on here. Basically, uh, Dave and I have been at a number of companies. We worked, as Joel mentioned, at DreamWorks on films like Handsome Shrek. I worked on the Matrix movies. Dave worked on uh, on a lot of video games like the ones from Disney, like Disney Infinity. We have a visual background. We're very big into visual collaboration, visual communication. And what we found is that as your companies get more and more distributed, that visual collaboration falls apart, breaks down. You've probably seen it in the form of having a meeting in front of a whiteboard, and then you point the webcam at the whiteboard to talk to people who are not at home, and then they can't contribute, and they're describing very carefully, no, draw over there, and then we're going down here, right? It's very painful. Worse yet, somebody takes a picture of the whiteboard with a phone and they mail out the picture of the whiteboard and then you have a locked picture of a whiteboard that you can't ever edit. So what we're trying to do um, is create an experience that's actually like a real whiteboard online. And there are a lot of tools that have tried this, but they're missing some key elements. Some of those elements are things like speed. You have to be able to draw just as fast as you do on a whiteboard, meaning you don't want to lag when you're drawing. If you see a lag, you're not going to draw. You can stop drawing and then this all falls apart. You have to be able to communicate with people while you're drawing. So we have video chat built into the system. It has to feel and look like a whiteboard. So some of the other tools out there, you start drawing, and it feels like they're trying to make you into a computer and draw like a computer. And as you can see from these pictures, those are actual pictures from the, from the tool, and you'll see it a little bit. They're designed to look like whiteboard strokes. And we're using new technology on the web that other people aren't using for office tools yet. 
Uh, so we've got some testimonies up here about how many people are, or how people are liking it, what they're using it for. Um, those are three. Let's talk a little bit about where we're going. Right. So uh, we came out of beta in December, four months ago. We had 250 users. We now have 10,000 users. That's a 4,000 percent increase in four months. We did that with $150 of advertising. That's not very much advertising. The way we did that was with integrations. Uh, a whiteboard by itself is not very useful. A whiteboard tied to tools that you're used to using already is. So we integrated with Slack. If you're familiar with that, it's a chat tool that's very popular right now. Uh, we integrated with the peer in. That's how we got the, uh, the video chat built into it. We have a whole lot more integrations planned because every time we add one, we get good questions about the users. Now, Slack is a really important part of our story. If you've heard about them at all, they have recently got their valuation up to around four billion. They did it on very little advertising because their chat tool they integrated with every other tool you have out there. We're following that plan. We're also uh, mimicking their uh, their pricing plan, where we have tiers built on top of a premium model. Um, you can go ahead and some of that. That's it. That's boring. <laughs> uh, that's a little more interesting. This is other ways we're getting people besides integrations. But you can skip that. Bad, bad, bad. Right. Um, so, uh, so what we're trying to do is do this kind of stuff that Slack did, be able to grow without the huge advertising spend, and it's working really well for us so far. These are some of our competitors. There's, I'll, you know, I'll be blunt and frank. There are a lot more competitors out there, uh, but what what's important about these is this is pretty an indicative slice of the competitors we have there, and they're missing some really important things. You have to be able to get onto a board with your team quickly. You shouldn't have to all have to sign up. You shouldn't have to install things. It needs to be natural drawing. And you can see the only other thing out there that has a natural style of drawing is, is paper by 53, which is a one person app only on the iPad. Uh, the only way they can be collaborative is if you save a picture, send it to somebody, they draw on it, send it back. We want to be able to draw on things all together at the same time. Um, so, yeah, you can, if you want to kill that, switch to the, the whiteboard. So, um, so, what we have here is this is the actual app running on Joel's laptop. Dave also has got it running on an iPad right here, and he, he can draw. You can see they can move around independently. So Dave and Joel don't have to be looking at the same thing at the same time. Uh, but because the whiteboard is infinite, they can go off and do work all over the place. Uh, and it really is really quite large. So we found, uh, in fact, Dave's kids were some of our beta testers early on. And uh, what they like to do is run off to a very far point on the whiteboard and draw something and then tell Dave to come find them, uh, which was really annoying. So we added a a tool called pins, which if you, if you use Google Maps, you drop a pin somewhere so people can find you. We do the same thing. You drop a pin somewhere on the whiteboard, you name it. Anybody can click on the name of that pin and fly to where you are. We have all kinds of hints, visual hints that are a little bit um, subtle up here, but knowing what's off the edge of the board, where they are, where the other people on the board are, uh, ways to communicate besides video chat if you just want to type. Um, and then, of course, all the integrations. Uh, we just finished a Google Drive integration today, so as you make a board, you can put it on Google Drive, and then everyone knows a quick way to get to the board. Um, so that's kind of what we've been doing, and we're growing really well. And I guess in the form of uh, of what you're doing here, um, that's I guess we covered all three three of your questions. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, is there something that they might get like a coupon? Yeah, that's what I was trying to get to. I was stumbling for a segue. Uh, so uh, Joel's going to be mailing out a coupon to all of you. Uh, after this meeting, after we get the coupon set up, uh, that'll allow you to click on the link, sign up for a Lindu account, and you'll get a free month of Lindu time. It's a reusable link, so share it with your friends. You can all click on it, get in there, and start using it. And the important thing behind that is that Lindu is not a single person tool, right? It works really well when you're all drawing together. So if you go on and draw by yourself, you're maybe not going to be as loud as you would be as, as you have two or three of your friends drawing on there together and starting to work on a project. And then remembering that that board is there forever, being able to come back to that project over and over and over as it grows. So that's it. Thanks for your time. Um, one of our board members, I'd like to have um, Mo Reed Mo come on up and talk about uh, our new membership program. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to you right next, and then we'll go into him. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Mo. I'm a board member here. I own a software company here in Salt Lake City focused on uh, mobile passports and destinations. But we, as we're talking about the future of the Salt Lake Circle, uh, we've decided to move our membership into a mobile platform to make it more effective to communicate with members, 
uh, make you all more aware of what we're doing. And one of the things that's coming with this membership is uh, the gun ball is going to be giving away a 40 person party for free to one of our members. Um, and only available to members at the 40 the 40 of our members, yep. And only available to those who elect to join the mobile membership program. Um, it will be free, um, you know, to the start with no cost. But the real goal here is to move this into sort of the 21st century where we can more effectively communicate with everybody. So you're very aware of the types of events we're doing. Um, so we can expose you to the vast resources that we have. But we want to push upon everybody to help you in your businesses. And so keep an eye out for that. Um, the transformation is going to be happening in the upcoming months here, uh, where we're not only really transitioning our whole digital presence in terms of our website, which we'll speak to in a moment here, um, but also moving the whole membership program here onto a mobile platform to make it more effective. So thank you. Hi everybody. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Tony Passi. Um, I'm the founder CEO of an agency that's located here in Salt Lake City. We're a creative agency uh, that a lot of digital assets for brands around the world. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about what Mo alluded to. We're making some changes um, with our with kind of our mission and our process. So I want to tell you a little story. So I've got a picture up here of uh, how do I go? There we go. Okay, so this is Katie. So, um, Katie's an entrepreneur, but she's our entrepreneur. She is an entrepreneur from SL Circle. Katie needs a little bit of help in accounting. If you've ever started a company, you probably know that there's some things you're really good at and some things that you're really not good at. Katie needs a mentor to be kind of a sounding board to help her build her business. And Katie also needs a little bit of supply chain help. She needs to figure out how to source some products that she's, uh, that she's working on. And so in beginning a business, Katie depends on her network. Her network is absolutely crucial. And so right now, we are the type of network that Katie encounters, but we're in a process of redefining and changing our network here at SL Circle. So SL Circle is in the process of restating its mission to train, to mentor, and to support entrepreneurs through education. We provide a lot of networking opportunity, a lot of networking events, um, a lot of capacity for you to connect with other members. But going forward, we're going to sharpen up that mission and really work toward more of a mentorship and education that's specifically designed to provide exactly what you need as an entrepreneur. And so one of the things that we are changing and we're working toward is we're going to hold an event toward uh, the end of the year in the fall. It's going to be called Bootstrap 2016. I bet you can't guess what next year's conference will be called. <laughs> so the character of Bootstrap 2016 is going to be very different than conferences that you've attended before. Only speakers that have run multi-million dollar businesses. There's going to be no pitching. You're not going to come up and hear somebody pitch, sign up for my $9.99 a month. That's, that's not what the purpose of the conference is. Um, if that's your goal and that's your mission as an entrepreneur, this is a great conference to attend to build your network and learn how to further your business. Um, but the point of the conference is going to be putting speakers in front of you that have been there. They've done it. The type of people that you would want to be mentored by. And so the last component is a very key component. There's going to be a follow-up mentoring process. So for people that have attended Bootstrap, there's going to be an opportunity to get involved in a mentoring program that follows the conference and probably goes through the next several months. Okay, so I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a preview. Um, you're going to hear Joel, you're going to hear myself and Mo and Thor and, and everybody 
that, that helps out with SL Circle begin to talk about a little bit of a difference in how we provide education, but all of it is on this mission to provide the very most well put together um, set of resources for someone who's an entrepreneur. Not just to make connections, but to get real training from somebody that you can look at and quickly see that they've, they've done it. They've built businesses, one business, several businesses, they've made millions. And you can get real education from somebody who's already been to where you want to go. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, as we've uh, made it to about 7.05, what I'm going to suggest we do is just have um, Levi go all the way through his presentation. Let's take a 10 minute break. Um, if you'd like to uh, meet with any of the people that presented, that'd be great. And then we'll have Levi McPherson come back and give us a simple point. Thank you.
Hello, hello, hello. All right, Joel has asked me to uh, get everybody back in their seats so we can get started again. And uh, just in case, for those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Thor. And hello. And I'm, a, I'm an attorney, and several people have been asking me for free legal advice. <laughs> and, uh, and, and basically what I do is try to avoid lawsuits from you when you ask me for legal advice. <laughs> no, the reason I'm up here is because uh, you know, it's my pleasure today to introduce Levi McPherson. He's the keynote speaker. He's the reason we all came here tonight. And uh, I think you're really going to enjoy it. He's really one of my favorite speakers for a couple of reasons. Number one is because he is so well prepared. He's got so much energy up here presenting. You're going to love his slides. And I think you get a lot out of, out of his presentation. But the other thing I really like about him, and this fits really well with uh, this bootstrap conference that Tony was just talking about, is that he's going to talk about principles. And so the stuff he's going to teach you is going to be useful in your business, really no matter what you do. And uh, it was just a few weeks ago, he was doing a presentation at our lunch hour, and he was talking about some principles. And you know, even though I've been in business telling other people what to do for over 20 years, there were some principles that he was talking about that made a lot of sense to me. And they, they actually gave me this aha moment of, that's how I can get my kid to stop playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when he gets to the, if he talks about, the principle of exchange, or the law of exchange, you'll, uh, you might think that now is that how did he get his kid to stop playing video games with that principle? Okay, but anyway, I hope that you really uh, enjoy this, stay for the whole presentation, because there's a lot of meat, a lot of principles in this presentation. So, Levi, thanks for coming. Pretty loud, but we'll see if this bad boy is. Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Um, so, who's here tonight because they want to learn how to make more money? Who came for the food? <laughs> Who came because their friend is Joel and he said you have to come? There you go. See? Honest people. That's what I'd like. Okay. So, we are going to talk about money tonight. Um, we're going to talk about some other things, and we might get a little bit experimental, um, depending on how responsive each of you are. But first, before we jump in, um, did I point that with the wrong one? I did, actually. Why don't you make more money? Throw some answers out. I mean, I've written some down here of ones that I've heard because I've asked this question a lot. Unlucky. unlucky? Did somebody say unlucky? I give it away. I give it away? <laughs> too old, too young, too tall, too short. I try to do too much myself and I become less effective at getting I don't trust anyone. Did everyone else hear that? I don't trust anyone else to do it as good as I do it. Right? That's what I heard. I know because I've been there. I, I've done a lot of I, my first business I did when I was, well, I was 17 years old. I sold it when I was 19. Anything else? I look like I'm 12. What's that? I look like I'm 12. Oh, you look like you're 12. You know, I remember when I was 29, I was a CEO of an internationally distributed company. We sold gifts to Walmart and Macy's and everybody else. And I kept getting asked questions. Where did you get your master's degree? Now, at the time, I had no degree. And I remember I felt really ashamed of that. 
So you know what I did? I dropped that business and went back to school because I believed that I needed that extra degree. Okay? So um, I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. Making money has more to do with how you think about it than what you actually do. Now, I know that sounds really counterintuitive because you've heard your entire life, you know, if you just work hard, then you'll make more money. Or if you just make the right connections, you network with the right people, your, your office is next to the bosses, or you move on to the street next to the millionaire, or whatever it is. But I'm here to tell you that it's more than that. There is more to do with psychology than you would think. Um, so I'm going to prove it. If you had more money, what would you do with it? First stop comes in your mind. It's brain soul. Travel. Travel. Perfect. I would work less. Work less. Reinvest my business. Reinvest your business. Okay. Yeah. Any others? Retire. Replenish my 401k. Replenish 401k. <laughs> Retire. Create a foundation. Create a foundation. Okay. That wasn't your first impulse, was it? Awesome. He's more in tune. Most people, wait, you had one. Here it comes. <laughs> now we're thinking. <laughs> uh, I guess I should have said I've got a million dollars or whatever it was. But most people, the first thought that pops in their head is I want to travel, I want a new fancy car. Um, I want uh, I want a maid. I want uh, somebody to cook my meals. I want a landscaper, <coughs> Pierre, whatever it is. So we're going to go through a couple of things here. Here's the problem: nearly half of the wealth in the entire world is controlled by a mere one percent. Do you believe that? One yeah. percent control half the wealth. Do you know how much, how many people control the two thirds of it? Any guesses? Or could it? Five percent control two thirds of it. Does that sound like a problem? Yeah. Now, depending on where you're at from a mentality standpoint, is that, oh, is that because, um, you know, I just, it's unfair, right? It's so unfair. It's just not fair. Why do they get that and I get this? Is that how it works? So, what do the top 5% do that the 95% don't do? And I don't know where you fall in that spectrum. I don't know if you're, you know, close to the top 5%. I don't know if you're, you know, somewhere at the bottom of the 95%. I can tell you I fluctuated all over that map. But I can tell you one thing, um, I've associated with people, um, either I've been in business with them, or I have gone to events with them, I have spoken with them, um, who run multi-billion dollar enterprises, uh, I've, I've hung out and raced race cars and blown up things with a lot of millionaires and multi-millionaires. <laughs> they all put their pants on one leg at a time. They all care about the waistline. They all care about what other people think about them. They care about uh, being in love and being in a relationship and having their kids respect them and all the same stuff that we care about. But there's something different about the way they approach life. Can I have someone read that for me? Don't would you read? No, you're eating food. I'll read it. Okay. I always knew I was going to be rich. I don't think I ever doubted it for a minute. So honestly. Who can say the exact same thing? I always knew I was going to be rich. I actually told a fiance this once. <laughs> uh, her mother didn't want us to get married because she wanted her to marry a famous football player. And I was a home security salesperson. And I said, babe, I'm going to be rich one day. It's just going to take time. And we might have to live in a, in a one-bedroom apartment, and we might have to sleep on a mattress on the floor. 
But it's going to happen. Think like a queen. A queen is not afraid to fail. This is one of my favorites, honestly. This is absolutely one of my favorites. If Alexander the Great could conquer the known world, why couldn't I start seeing it? So you notice that pattern there between their words? What's different in their words than perhaps your own words? Attitude. Attitude? No doubt. No doubt. Like it's not even just a hope, right? Or a, an extended faith. There's, there's a level of confidence, there's certainty. So this is my personal story. Um, I mentioned that uh, I had, I can't remember if I mentioned to everyone, but I started my first business when I was 17, sold it when I was 19. Um, I was that kid that was reading business books in junior high. I was a nerd. I wore the Tigra shirts <laughs> and, and penny loafer shoes, and I was picked on. But I knew by the time I hit junior, junior high that I wanted to own businesses. I don't know why I knew that. I just knew that that's something that I wanted to do in life. Um, I grew up extremely poor. And maybe that was part of it. I knew I didn't like being poor. I didn't like handing down clothes. I did not like. Um, I didn't like being picked on because we drove up in the clunker cars. I just I hated it. Um, but I also my friends were wealthy kids. I don't know how somehow I made friends with all the wealthy kids. Maybe I was funny or whatever. Um, or they just kept me around because it made them feel better about themselves. Who knows? <laughs> but. I, I jumped into business. I, uh, I dropped out of school at a college to, to buy a business. My first turnaround um, business, was, that was what my background was. Uh, we took it from a business that was about a half a million in, in past due vendor debt um, to a multi million dollar success in just under two years. And sold that, went on to, to do several other ventures like that. Um, you know, had, had investors, built glass buildings, built sales organizations. Did a lot of fun things. I've written some books. I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of the brands you're familiar with, Disney and Nike and Marriott and YouTube and others. Um, but here's the problem that I have. Um, <laughs> do you want to buy my baby? I got to a point where things were so low, I actually said this. Do you want to buy my baby? I called a buddy because I had I gotten out of I, I decided I wasn't going to build those buildings anymore. I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna do it. Golden shackles be gone. So I branched out and started doing my own thing, just consulting with a few friends, businesses, and I wasn't making a lot of money. So I said, I have a grand piano in my living room. Would you like to buy it? It is truly my baby. It's like my second wife. <laughs> It's, it's like that important to me. Yes, it wasn't a real baby, just in case she was worried about it. She's like, was you really, did you really sell this baby? No, I didn't really sell my baby. <laughs> and no, he told me no. He said, that account's too important to you. So. But I needed it. So I told my neighbor, which was my other neighbor. Um, but I, although I had all the stigma of success, um, I drove a very fancy car. I lived in a gated community. Everyone thought I was a big, successful individual. I was broke. I was dead broke. And I was frustrated. I was depressed. Um, every time I thought about money, it was, you know, that, you know, the money headache? You've all had it, right? The money headache? You know what I'm talking about? So I learned something powerful amidst the low that. Um, I used, one of the businesses I did years ago was a health business. Um, we sold these, these health magnets. And I remember I used to think all about, you know, you don't play with magnets and you push them the wrong way and they repel against each other. That's what I was doing to money. I was pushing it away. Kind of like if you ever walked in a, if you ever walked down the street and suddenly, you know, it's like rain all around you, but it's not raining on you. And I'm like, what in the world's going on? It was kind of like that. There was money raining down all around me, but I was just pushing it away. And then I had a dream. 
but I call the hope dream. Now, I am not a rainbows, unicorns, ponies, and dragons kind of guy. I'm not a mystic. I'm not a clairvoyant kind of guy. And that's just not my shtick, right? Um, so I think maybe it was the tacos I ate or something, but I had this dream. And in the dream, I was having a conversation with, uh, with a gentleman. We're sitting at this table, and um, I was telling him how I was going to basically help all these people. I was going to change the world. I was going to do these amazing things. And he said to me, how are you going to do that? Kind of like, hey, you punk kid. <laughs> like, what are, you know, how in the world are you going to do everything that you just said that you were going to do? And you know, dreams are really abstract and weird, um, and they don't make a lot of sense in the real world. Uh, so I just grabbed a, a thing of tape. I said, oh, that's easy. And I put this tape down on the table. I pulled out a magic marker, which, who knows, maybe I pulled out of the cloud. And I wrote the word hope. I'm going to do it with hope. And then, you know, dreams are weird. They go a little abstract. So the words popped over into this cloud-looking thing. And this probably tells you more about how my brain works than inspiration. But each of the letters in the word hope spelled out an acronym. Help others prosper exponentially. My mind in the dream caught a hold of the word exponentially. I'm like, oh, that's a little bit different. Like, it's one thing to get people to prosper but exponentially. That means it has to continue. That means it has to compound and grow and grow and grow. And so in the dream, I had these, you know, I wrestled around with this idea. I'm like, okay, there, there are definitely prosperity engines, like, you know, the things that you do for your body and health and whatnot. But this exponential thing, that seems pretty important. Um, so during that dream, I had this, this phrase come to mind. You know, you need to help them with wealth engines. I had no idea what that means, by the way. I just woke up and I told my wife, well, hey, it's a great dream. It was really cool. And I was telling people, this is how I was going to do it. She's like, you should write it down in the book. Oh, maybe. We'll see. So I told some other people about it. And um, I have this saying that I've had on my wall since college. Um, be the change you want to see in the world. And I never wanted to be that guy. You know, like you go down to Gold's Gym, and there's <laughs> there's the guy with a really big gut that's a personal trainer. It's like, hey, do do lunges, right? Like you do lunges. <laughs> You're the guy that needs the help. I never wanted to be that guy, and so I figured if I was going to help people to prosper, it couldn't just be based on principles and stories from other people that had done it. I had to try and experiment, experiment myself. So I mentioned I was a nerd, and I had been reading books forever. Um, I had applied principles in my businesses, but I never applied them towards my own finances. I never applied them towards my own personal life for some reason. Um, so I started applying them. And I discovered a process that worked for me. Um, in fact, by following this process, I was able to double my income in just one day. In fact, beyond that, or um, so it was three weeks ago, right? Yep. I've doubled my income again since that last meeting. Right? Just following this process, just plotting hard. And I, I am not one of those claims kind of guy, right? I'm not going to promise anybody that you can do that. I'm just telling you, there is a process that does work. Um, so I started helping other people to do it. And I'll tell you about a few of those in just a little bit. Um, and I found more truths and refined this. You know, I started at least, I think, 16 books that I didn't finish because I debate with myself and find new truths. <laughs> right, yeah, I'm one of those. <laughs> um, so I decided to share. So that's why I'm here today, to share with you some of the things that um, I have learned. <laughs> Was really well coordinated. <laughs> I'm like, wow, it had a sound. <laughs> so, what I discovered, I'm labeling the power frequency. It is a frequency that allows you to basically communicate and receive everything that will make you prosperous. 
but basically the ability to transmit and receive everything that will make the processor. Okay. Um, it's this is how my mind thinks, and this is what I you know this is what I discovered. It's like a pyramid. There are laws, and above those laws there are principles that you can apply, and then beyond that it's skills. And so as I teach you some of these things, and I told you that you know I you know I have this process of doubling my income and so on and so forth, and I've had other people do the same. Um, if it's happening for you, it's because you're aligning all, on all three of these things, laws, principles, skills. If not, you're probably not applying some principles or skills based on the law, if that makes sense. So I'm just going to go through five laws of power today. Um, law number one, the law of energy. So the lights that are funded are powered here, and the microphone is powered here. Do you know they run? They operate on a very similar system as, as your body. They operate on a very, I mean, it's all electrical. It's, it, your brain sends out a signal. It's chemical, but it's electrical. So when I'm raising my arm like this, that's because my brain sends these signals. Well, guess what? Your brain can send signals a lot further than you think. Here's the truth. Everything we believe has the energy to bring to pass something into the physical world. So this is where I do the lunatic test, right? So, um, what's 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 crazy to you? What's really crazy to you? Uh, taking a taking a flight from New York to LA in 12 minutes. Does that sound impossible? Is that a lunatic thing? Look it up. It's closer than you think. Um, calling somebody on a mobile device to the other side of the planet and talking in real time. Is that a lunatic thing? Is that crazy? Uh, a device no bigger than my thumb broadcasting online everything that I'm doing right now. For the whole globe to access if they want to. Is that insane? It's it's insane. Depending on where you're at. So if this was a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, everything that we live in our current reality is insane. It is the lunatic test. We are living in insanity for people in the past. So what you believe can be created in the future and what will happen in the future, by the way, is crazy. It's insane to us. What I'm hoping to accomplish tonight is to break down some of the barriers for you of belief. Um, I heard a fascinating story about um, Magellan. I think it was Magellan. Uh, it landed in South America and they could, they literally could not see the boat. People ran out, worshipped him, worshipped the people, but they couldn't see the big boats because it wasn't in their belief system. And it wasn't until they put them on the little rowboat and took them out to the big boats that they could see the boats with the sails. Guess what? The same thing happens to us because we don't believe. So have you ever had this happen before? Hey, that was my idea. Did you know in eighth grade, I invented the Nike Air Shop shoes? Eighth grade. I even made a prototype. I cut out my Jordache shoes, I tore out the sole, and I took my dad's, um, oh, he had these uh, transmission line bleeders, these little, it's like basically like a big shot. And I, I capped the top of them off with hot glue so they'd have some compression. And I had four of them in my heel. I'm like, yeah, check it out. I won't sprain my ankle this way. I'm Greg Duncan. I'm so cool. And then somebody else had that idea. Now, why is that? Why did somebody else come up with it instead of me? Did they steal my idea? How many of you have had ideas like that stolen? And if you're not raising your hand, you're lying. <laughs> you are lying. Because I know every single one of you has had an idea, and then you see it have, show up on the, on, in the store, online, and it's a big success, you're like, oh, thief. 
they stole my idea. Why does that happen? Do you think ideas are, 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 are local or global? They're global. They're absolutely global. And so while I'm sitting here thinking about my idea, not only am I tapping into a global idea, but I'm also transmitting it to everybody else that's in tune with that same frequency. And so we're co-collaborating, even though I don't even know Bruce. I never even met him before, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, this would be the best app in the world. I can use the marker board thing, and it's gonna revolutionize the way that people collaborate, which is gonna make people more money, and it's gonna be awesome. <sighs> he was the first one to do it. Successfully, right? So <laughs> what about this? How do you know someone is staring at you? How do you know? Do you have eyes in the back of your head? How does that happen? I was riding down the road the other day, and, and for some reason I was staring at this girl because I thought I knew her, and I said, you know. And then she thought I was checking her out. Like, no, 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 not that. I thought I knew you. Right? How does that happen? There is a frequency. Or the, uh, hey, I was just thinking about calling you. We got on the same page. We were on the same frequency. And we didn't even talk about it. Or how does a mother know that, there's, that her child is in trouble when they're in another state or they're across the globe? How does she know? How does someone know when someone has passed away? How do we know that stuff? Lunatics. We're lunatics. That's how we know. Here's the thing. The same technology that we now think, oh, no big deal. I could cell phone. I call somebody. That's been built into our biology forever. We've always been able to do this. It's not new. Do you know that now, they actually, um, there's some articles if you Google it that show that all of us are mind readers. They hooked up some machines to people that had them send mentally words to people, and those people were able to dictate those words. We can communicate you know, again, I'm not a rainbows and unicorns kind of guy. But I'm telling you, this stuff is real. Um, this one, the, I, mean, I, I had to do it. I'm going to do a politically charged one. I just, I couldn't resist. I love doing these kinds of things. So, um, have you ever seen these episodes where they put the cats on people during the elections? They don't, am I the only nerd that's like, Oh, this is amazing. I almost bought one of these machines, by the way, a few years ago, because I wanted to see how people reacted to our marketing. So during this current election, there is one candidate, regardless of political affiliation, that every time he shows up, every time he opens his mouth, brains light up. Every single time. He also happens to be a billionaire. He also happens to have some kind of strange magnetism and influence. Now, I'm not predicting he's going to win or anything else. I just want to show a strange occurrence that's really odd. Remember I said the top 5%, they operate a little bit differently? Well, here's a guy who, again, <laughs> when he shows up on the screen, people like him. So this is how it works. Whatever we think and feel, we emit energy waves. You cannot stop it. It does happen. Um, it's how you know when you get out of a car in a dangerous neighborhood and you're like, oh, I feel like I shouldn't be here. Get back in the car. Y'all had that experience? No one has to say anything to you. You just felt it, right? So we transmit, we receive, and hopefully, we block. We block the crap out that we don't want. Mostly, to be honest, we avoid. Um, so, back to money. So what are you thinking and what are you feeling? Is it stress? So this is a real story. I was going to tell this later in the presentation. Um, I had a gal that I was working with, and she um, does a health coaching business. And it was just growing like crazy. And all of a sudden, everything just stopped. 
and she started feeling like she was a salesperson and just no one, no one would respond to her. And so we sat down and we went through a, a, a clearing process together. And come to find out in her family, her husband had planned a vacation, a very expensive vacation, and got the kids all excited about it. And she wasn't sure if they could afford it. And so what she had done is started repelling it. So she started self-sabotaging. She went up and got a credit card and maxed it out, which she doesn't do. And she started pushing away people that were going to give her money. And as soon as she realized what was happening and we went through a clearing process, guess what? The floodgates turned back on and her business continued to grow. It's, it's literally doubled since then. So, um, what are you thinking about money? Anyone stressed about money? No? If you're not, it's because you have lots of it. <laughs> okay, thoughts and feelings. That's what we're dealing with. That's the mechanics. Um, thoughts send out a signal, a uh, feeling to the strength. So, the more intensely you feel something, the more powerful the signal. That's why when your kid's in trouble, you know, they're scared or something horrible's happening, there is a signal being sent very strongly. Okay? Um, <laughs> I just put these in there because I, there was different emotions with money because I thought they were funny. Yeah, that's what you should be feeling, right? Yes! Um, I took the slide out, but do you know what um, Donald Trump's opinion about money is? What, what's his belief system? Anyone know? Money is the score of the game. It lets me know by how far I've won. I just love playing the game. It's literally a game for him. So do you think he gets stressed about it? Well, he might, but probably mostly it's just a game. Oh man, somebody else is winning the game now, so what I gotta do to outmaneuver and, and win? Right? So he does that maneuver. Um, she's not praying for the money, by the way. <laughs> she's being grateful for the money. I, I have found that, that gratitude is a incredibly powerful emotion to apply to anything that you want to bring into your life, into the physical world. Um, it's kind of one of those secrets. Okay. Do you guys feel daring tonight? Don't do something crazy? Okay. All right, this is what we need to do. Um, you're going to partner up with one other person. I know, we're getting all mystic and workshop here. So you're going to partner up with one other person. Uh, I just want to prove to you that this stuff, uh, and again, I'm not rainbows and unicorns, but you're going to partner up with somebody else. One of you is going to put your hands, your palms, face up on your lap, and the other one, you're going to sit knee to knee. Don't come here. Oh. <laughs> I read it in the book, so I had to try it. I'm one of those, I hear it, and I'm like, oh, that can't be real. That doesn't work. So you're going to sit knee to knee with somebody. You put your palms up. And then the other person, you're going to put your palms over, like so. But the person with their palms over, all you're going to do is focus on one of the hands. You're not going to tell anyone. You're going to focus on sending energy through one of the hands. And he's going to identify which of the hands you're sending energy to. You guys game? Okay. We're going to do this. Can you give this letter to you? <laughs> yes. And then you're going to take turns. Okay? Go. Oh, I see. Yeah, 
It's weird, huh? Once you felt it switch. We've got a few more minutes. Just if you didn't get a chance to send the signal, switch. We have to send send more intense emotions here. Think Lord Voldemort. Honestly, I was doing this with a friend, and he literally felt a shock. And he's like, well, what were you thinking when you sent it? And I was like, I was thinking the Lord Voldemort. I will curse you. <laughs> Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Hey, how many people actually felt something? Okay, so I'm going to say there was about 35% of the room that felt it when you sent something. So if you didn't feel anything, it's okay. Go home and practice that with your wife just because it's just because it's kind of weird and kind of cool. But those of you that did feel something, raise your hands again. Okay, so you felt something. What did you feel? Well, I had my hand down. It felt like a breeze coming from both my hands. I noticed it's like the air was circulating from both of them. It's weird. And then it felt like one was strong. So we had a little bit higher concentration of that. Yeah. And I guess that would have to be. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's not a big deal. I mean, it's not like a, yeah, we're not quite wanting to. This is just this is just science. This is not like some kind of, the reason why I have you do eight inches apart is just so it's not based off the warmth. That makes sense. Um, did you have it too close? Okay, yeah, if you had it too close, honestly, the warmth probably would have thrown you off. Sorry. It's just I've never done this with Victor before, and I was a little bit nervous. I'm like, oh, are they going to think I'm a weirdo? <laughs> but I just wanted you to experience it. If you didn't, try it at home. Seriously. It, it's, it's not freaky. It's just science. So, okay, we're going to jump into the law of outcomes. This is my favorite law. If I can attribute... Um, any of my business successes, this is the law. Honestly, this is the law after getting the right mindset, after getting into the right power frequency, getting the right energy. This law, if you if you truly pay attention, this will change your businesses. This will change your lives. This will show you how to accomplish anything that you want at all, period, bar none. Okay? Every outcome is attached to a process. You cannot dispute that. Every outcome is attached to a process. Therefore, if you change your process, you will change your outcome. No matter what. I am a process guy. We're not making enough cash flow. We're not collecting. I look at it and say, all right, well, what's the process that we're currently following? And what do I want to have happen? Where in that process can I apply some change? So, 
the earlier in the process you apply change, the more leverage you have. I'll give you just a simple example of this. Um, one of my first businesses was a manufacturing company, and um, we were delivering these high-end cabinets, and we were on a 50-50, right? 50% um, deposit, 50% with the job's done. Well, if a knob was you know, a little bit too high or too low, or a door wasn't aligned perfectly in the installation process, they're holding 50% of the revenue over my head. You can't survive on, on a 50% cash flow. So we said, where do we have the most leverage? We have the most leverage at the point of sale. So let's change things up. Let's go with a 50, 40, 10. 50% 50 when we signed the deal, 40% when I deliver the goods, and 10% is for satisfaction. You hold it over my head until you are completely thrilled with what we do. Well, guess what? At 90%, we're profitable already. That 10% just makes things gravy. It's awesome. That's what I'm talking about. So if you, you know, as far as the law of outcomes, if you wanted to, if you wanted to lose weight, if you wanted to get in shape, what is the process that you're currently following? Well, I go to the grocery store, the hobos call my name, and I put them in the cart, and they go home with me. <laughs> then, when I'm watching television, the hobos call me again. And then the hobos go in my mouth. And somehow it shows up around here. And I look like I'm wearing a rubber ducky. I don't get it. Right? That's the process. Well, where do I have the most leverage? Is it when the hobos call my name? No. Is it is it when I was even at the grocery store? Mm, well, no, it's even before then. It's before I went to the grocery store. When I went to the grocery store without a goal, without a list of what I was going to accomplish. Does that make sense? The earlier in your process. So if you don't have belief, if you don't have a strong belief that you absolutely are going to be wealthy, you absolutely are going to make the income, or better yet, that you have the value that you think you should, what is your mental, psychological process? So where did it start? That's where you change it. You get leverage. Okay? Um, so, basically, if you can change what your thoughts and feelings are about money, it's guaranteed you're going to change your financial outcomes. You, you can't help it. So, and now, the law of attraction. We've already heard this one. We might go home. We already know this one. We read the book The Secret, right? We already know. If I sit in my if I sit in my living room chair and go, the Ferrari is by the couch. The Ferrari's by the couch. It just works that way, right? I'm not exactly. <laughs> uh, you only get the things that you actually want. You only get the things that you desire. So because I actually didn't want the money. I know that sounds stupid, but I didn't want the money because I equated the money to pain and stress for all these weird reasons. Money is the root of all evil, and rich people are bad. Wait, where did I hear that? Oh, my dad, my whole life, I heard it over and over and over and over. Those poor farmers, they get new trucks every single year. Those poor farmers, they get motorcycles and, and, and they get four wheelers and Oh, that's scary. You know, they live up on that snob hill. Look at them. Heard it my whole life. So I had to be undone. So I'm going to tell a little story here that wasn't planned, but it's all good. So I was on vacation down to St. George, um, and my daughter um, was playing by a building that had this little pony wall around it. It was a brick pony wall. And um, the brick, you know, the pony wall was no taller than this chair. But the brick perfectly matched the building. So my other daughter sees her and she just starts booking it. She's like towards the building, thinking, I want to go play with my older sister. It looks like fun, right? And she hit that pony wall full force, topples, you know, end over end, tears up her leg. There's blood gushing everywhere. And I'm running over there as a dad going, What just happened? Did you not see the wall? No, I didn't see it, Daddy. So we got her taken care of. We went to Walgreens and bandaged her up. And 
And she was fine. Well, later I was thinking about it. I'm like, oh my goodness, that is exactly what I used to do in life when it came to money. I see the big building and I go, yeah, and I run out of full steam. And then I find myself on my back bleeding everywhere. I'm like, what in the world just happened? So what happens is there is a psychological pony wall that I had not removed. And the only way to remove it is to go through a revolution, a freedom exercise. You have to clear those things up. And that's what the process of peace does. All right, our dominant feelings push us towards or away from our desires. We already covered that, actually. Um, and this kind of goes into that pony wall. The way our brains work is they work looking backwards, unfortunately, is, is a filter. So if you can think about it like glasses, right? If I'm wearing glasses and I'm painting and a fleck of paint gets on my glasses, well, for the ever thereafter, unless I clean my glasses, I'm going to always see that fleck of paint every time I stinking turn around. That fleck of paint is a belief, it's an emotional anchor. Anyone ever read any of works on imprinting or know what imprinting is? Oh yeah, oh for sure, you'll know. You'll know exactly. She works with uh, basically <laughs> mental health, right? So imprinting. What is imprinting? Basically, um, well, it's sort of like a conditioned response. You know, whatever um, you attach, something that, that you know happened in the past, you'll attach it to that, like you said, anchoring, you know, to that that stimulus. How does it get started? Well, I mean, it could be positive or negative. You know, right, exactly. But what absolutely has to be there for in order for an imprint to happen? Um, like, well, the stimulus, you know, like a stimulus and an emotion. An emotion. Yeah. An emotion. You and cannot emotion. have a true imprint without an emotion. Right. So the, the feeling has to be attached to it and so strongly. Right. So when my dad said, those poor farmers, and I felt all yucky inside, I had an imprint, right? That's a speck of paint on my glasses. And so I'm walking around with all these speckles all over my glasses going, I don't know why I keep tripping over the pony wall. It really hurts and I hate it. I go and clear them up, okay? So change the emotions attached to your memories and you change the now. And I know this sounds like soft science, right? It sounds like the, you know, the foo-foo, touchy-feely kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, it is real. That five, the top five percent, they have different feelings about money. Those people that have incredible relationships. And I can tell you, I have a phenomenal relationship with my wife. Have a different feeling and definition about what a relationship is. So I don't get in the same turmoil that a lot of people that I'm associated with do. It's not just soft science. Okay, the law of creation. Simple. Everything, no matter what it is, money, relationships, uh, health, everything we desire has to first be created psychologically before it can be manifested physically. Can't be disputed. If you didn't have an idea about the whiteboard thing, guess what? It never comes to pass. Okay? So anything we can see with clarity and feel with certainty, we can create. So just curious, were you guys that created this, what was the name of the whiteboard? Lynn knew? Were you excited? Were you stoked in your minds when you were putting it together? Yeah. Right? Isn't it that way when you collaborate on a business and you put together this? I mean, the, actually, it's the whiteboard process, right? Everybody does it. You know, we write out the diagrams and we brainstorm and we're like, man, this is the best idea ever. It's going to be amazing. And we infuse it with all this positive energy. And the more times we do that, the more momentum it gets. Right? And you guys knew exactly what you wanted. Why? Because you had used the other tools that you hated. <laughs> so that's how often 
works. All right, the law of exchange. This is what will get your teenager to stop playing video games, I've heard. Yes. Okay, pay attention to this one. Um, this one will also help you with doing business with other people a lot. We only make exchanges for things that we value more than what we're exchanging for. Not equal, not less. It has to be more valuable. So I have to want to clean the specs off the glasses and stop getting my knee cut up more than I want to keep running really fast at that wall. I, if I'm going to do business with any of you, you have to want what I have to offer you more. If you want to help at-risk children and you're talking to me as an entrepreneur, I have to want to help more than what I'm currently doing. Or whatever it is you're asking me to exchange, if it's money, then I have to look at that and go, all right, I will feel this by exchanging that. And by the way, it is one of my dreams and my visions to help youth to understand the things I didn't understand to get into business. So that's a conversation we should have. If we're not experiencing change, it's because we don't value whatever it is more than what we have. You don't really want it. You don't really value it. Do you believe that? Ouch. But doesn't that what kind of hurt? Doesn't that what kind of feel like a kick in the stomach? Right? Oh, shoot. So you're telling me that I value my Diet Coke? More than the six pack abs? Yeah. All right? Whatever it is, you just have to stare it in the mirror and look at what it is and say, yep. So we can either um, we can either increase the value of what we want. These are ways you can change to turn this around. Or you can decrease the value of what you want to exchange. Just a yin yang thing. Can you put that back? Oh, yep, going back. Back it up. You can either increase the value of what? Oh, that doesn't even make gram grammatical sense, does it? <laughs> you can either increase the value of what? Oh, I, it's because I'm saying it wrong. I'm adding a U. You didn't grow up with me, I did you? I grew up on a farm in southeastern Idaho. <laughs> I was technically a goat milker. Bonafide. I milk a lot of goats. Okay, got it? Okay, uh, you can change the value of anything by changing what it means. What I mean by that is this. Um, I do, with my clients, I do a gratitude exercise or a re-association exercise. I say, you know, let's make a list of the crappiest things that have ever happened to you. And then let's Let's make another list of how we can be grateful for those things. How can those mean something more? And in the outcome, like I'm one of my absolute most grateful experiences. When I was in high school, I got extremely sick. I would go into spasms and full-blown seizures every single day. I missed two-thirds of my junior year because I was bashing my head against the floor. And I can tell you, to this day, of everything I experienced in high school, that is the single, the one I'm the single most grateful for. Because it changed the way I view other people. I didn't care about other people before that happened. I was selfish. That was out of me. That was mostly out of fear. You know, out of, oh. Wow. I guess we're done. <laughs> it's not a problem. We were close to the end anyway. Um, so, here's the bottom line. What about the seven secrets that control how much money you can make? I know I've talked about a lot of things, and technically you could extrapolate from that seven secrets or 27 secrets, because I've covered a lot of things, but I want to give you more. Um, I learned... I learned a long time ago that if you really want to change what you're doing, 
or you want to change the world or change your business or change your circumstances, instead of going out and um, setting up a business and declaring that you know exactly what to do, um, find some people and start helping them. Don't ask anything for it. Just start doing it. And in the process, you'll be able to refine everything. So like, you know, it's basically beta testing. You just have a cooler way of saying it than I did. But, right? So you beta test. So what I, what I propose is this. Seven secrets in seven days. I want to spend seven days training you on the full process. How do you get rid of that brick wall that you keep tripping on? How do you even find this thing to brick wall? How do you change the way you feel or believe about money? So I've created a group on Facebook. And it's brand new. It doesn't even have graphics on it. Um, my tech guy just did it, I think, earlier today when I was driving over. Um, it's called Seven Day Riches. Seven Day Riches. If you will join that group starting on Monday at 7 a.m. <laughs> there was the pause. At 7 a.m., I will spend some time teaching you. There's no charge for it. There's no pitching. Like, what was that list? I had to run a multi-million dollar company. I couldn't pitch. And I had to have nice hair. Now, what was the third one? I can't remember what it was. But basically, mentoring. This is the mentoring part, Joel. I'm mentoring, right? Ongoing mentoring. I want to mentor you for seven full days. I'm not going to ask you for anything. I just want to help because I want more experiences. I want more case studies. Um, so if you will sign up for that, I will send you an invite. There, who's not on Facebook, by the way? I know some people are like anti they like, I don't want any past girlfriends to find me. Everybody on Facebook, right? Okay, good. Some people are anti, it's all good. Um, and this is what you can expect from me. Uh, I will do everything in my power to make sure that you understand the process I personally went through. Um, I'll share some experiences with people. Like I have, uh, I was going to show you a slide. Anyone ever seen that um, that YouTube video, the funny one, the real fruit ninja, the big guy chopping fruits? Close buddy of mine, there's Christian Busey. Um, he's had over 300 million views on his YouTube videos, over 300 million. And guess what? He's been pushing money in a way as well. And not only that, what he really, really, really wants is to direct his own movie. He wants to do this, the Sylvester Stallone thing, right? So we went through a process with him, cleared out some of the brick walls, and he actually went out and he wrote a movie script pitch. And then he realized he needed money so he could write it. So I had him do another process, and guess what? While we were doing the process, he got an email somebody offering him money to pay him for, to write a script. It's weird. I'm just saying. So, cosplay. Was that cosplay? We're going to put cosplay together. So, I know we've gone a little long. I think you're probably all ready to go home. Uh, seven Day Riches. Yeah, oh, the number seven. Fun. Sorry, the number seven. Oh, thank you. See, <laughs> seven day riches. There we go. So, 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 Yes. It's almost 30 million. Yeah, in my other life, I made YouTube videos. <laughs> if you can't. Yeah. <laughs> 
Hey, John. Would you send an email to everyone if I I'm just gonna find a white why the pages in line with Cody. Cody door inside of mine. And I'll send everybody the invite. Does that work? <laughs> I love Christian. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's my buddy Christian. By the way, two weeks two weeks after we went through the, the uh, process with Christian, I can't tell you the name, but he's he got invited to go film in Europe with the most famous soccer player in the world. And they paid really well to do it. So crazy stuff can happen. Um, so unfortunately, I guess the page is not live on Facebook. Well, the ability for us to reach out to all these people is there. Um, if you um, didn't, um, if you found out about this through an invite, just go to um, meetup.com slash circle, and as soon as we have that, then we'll have it in the comments. It will be right as well. Okay. Other than that, feel free to hang out, and I can answer any questions you have. But other than that, thank you, and prosperity and peace. Again, we've got some fun lunches coming up. Patrick Crowley, as well as Margaret Romney. Um, this Thursday, if everything works out, we're going to have two really, 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 really cool father and son um, so on the next one we have on Tuesday. John Richards from Startup Mission and Tyler Richards who founded Dev Mountain. If everything works out with your schedules, they'll be here on the third Tuesday of next month in the circle. We appreciate your support. You guys are more than welcome to hang out for another half hour or so. And um, again, thanks for coming. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Um, you know, when you're talking about the afternoon yeah. Yeah. There. It kind of reminds me. That was mine. That mine is. I want to hold it. I could have had it on the 
Somebody that's going to be able to help you out. Tell me more about what you do. Um, the, um, it's over now. Really? I think I use this, like where are some of the places here? We're in Price now. We're currently in Richfield. We have a roadmap of Price this year. Folks, help me season on the food. If anybody wants to take it or take it or anything else, you have approximately five minutes or it is going in the trash. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 